So um, before I get started, I want to start with a question. Um, so I guess let's, what's in this photo? Um, if I was really organized, I would organize a poll. But when I'm confused, I turn like everybody else to the modern solution of a machine learning classifier. Now, if I provide this image to a classifier, it thinks for a while and it says, looks like a tree. But what if we take a step back? It looks more like a forest. And there's a famous English expression about uh, missing the, the forest for the trees. And I'm going to use that metaphor to try and describe the problem that I think exists in modern code review interfaces. Okay, so today's talk is entitled uh, Promoting Situational Awareness in Code Review Platforms. And it's a little bit different than the talks that I've given at uh, this Garrett User Summit in the past. In the past, I've tried to report on research results we've already completed. And today I'm gonna try and tell you about the research program that I'm working on uh, in collaboration with another professor, Michael Godfrey, at the University of Waterloo. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So it's useful for me to start these talks usually with a definition of what code review looks like, which is kind of a, a silly thing to do at this workshop, but just to, to give you an idea, let's imagine that I'm a developer and I've uploaded a change to a tool like Garrett, uh, Garrett may initi initiate some smoke tests, uh, which will provide feedback. I may solicit the review of other experts on the team who will also provide feedback. And maybe there's an additional phase where integration tests are executed, which also provides feedback. And eventually after satisfying project specific requirements, um, we're allowed to merge our change upstream. Now, there are several uh, benefits to adopting a code review practice uh, that are both technical and non-technical. And the research uh, shows this as well. It's not just like a gut feeling kind of thing. So there, in terms of technical benefits, um, we found that the early detection of defects is a key benefit. So areas of code that have been reviewed more carefully tend to be less buggy than areas of code that haven't been reviewed carefully. Code review is also a place where alternative approaches get discussed. So if you're going down the wrong path, we can catch it before integration and kind of change your solution to be more congruent with design or architectural considerations. Um, but it's not just technical benefits, there are also non-technical benefits. So uh, code review is a place where a lot of peer mentorship is happening. Uh, code review is a place where teams can communicate about changes that are coming that may affect other teams. So let's say I'm developing an API that another team de depends upon and I'm changing that API, I can include the other team in my code review just so that they're aware something's coming down uh, that they should know about. And it's also a place where collaborative problem solving takes place. So there is this kind of narrow perspective of defect, uh, sorry, of being this place where we're hunting for defects, but that's kind of too narrow for what actually happens in code review. Um, it's a place where, where experts can work together to solve complicated problems as well. Now that I've kind of built up code review as this amazing thing, I should also point out that it's not without its costs. And uh, there are several of those. So in the literature, it's been reported that developers spend on average six hours per week reviewing code. And it's also been reported that up to 35% of those review comments that they generate during review are considered not useful by their peers. So there's a lot of waste and there's a lot of engineering time spent on code review. But today what I want to twist and focus on is what actually happens during code review and the, the perspective that's provided to reviewers and authors. So it, 
code review is still to this day largely based on sleuth work uh, clever developers reviewing each other's changes and pointing out things um, based on their independent detective work. And they're doing that based on textual differences. So added lines and removed lines with respect to some baseline. Now, I'm not gonna say that text-based differences are a poor solution. They're very pragmatic, especially for a scenario where um, you know, it's a heterogeneous repository with lots of technologies being used. Everything that's text-based can be fed to the diff algorithm and we can produce a patch. So it's kind of this common denominator that helps us perform review across heterogeneous repositories. But that text-based difference is missing a lot of the broader context that we would like reviewers and authors to focus on. So let's say I'm the author, I may have questions about the patch I've produced, like does my patch set impact the right deliverables? I, I think I've made a change to deliverable X, is it actually gonna impact it in the way that I think it does? And I may wonder about concurrent development. So other people are working on the project at the same time. I might wonder, is my change conflicting with any of those changes? And reviewers may wonder, you know, how risky is this change? Uh, most of the time, the top reviewers are really busy um, and they need to prioritize their effort. So knowing how risky a change is might help them to, to decide how much effort they invest in a review. And reviewers might also wonder which users might be impacted by this change. So a large system has a very broad user base. Uh, if you're making a change that only affects users running Windows 95, maybe we don't care as much as a change that affects a more modern platform, right? So this is where we come back to this forest for the trees metaphor. So in my opinion, text-based differences are like this zoomed in focus on the tree. Um, it gives a nice fine-grained perspective, but what we're really missing is the forest, right? So are we missing the forest for the trees? And what we're setting out to do over the next three to five years working on this research program is to incorporate several perspectives into the reviewing interface. And the four that we're focusing on initially are the historical perspective, the deliverable perspective, the operational perspective, and the concurrent development perspective. So I'll spend some time talking a little bit about what I mean by each of these for the remainder of the talk. But why am I giving this talk here? Well, the goal is for each one of these perspectives to end up in a concrete form of a prototype plugin uh, for the Garrett Code Review platform. So you can imagine that the students and I that are working on these uh, ideas, these concepts, we're going to try and realize them in plugins that we contribute back to the community. Okay, so let's dive in to the first dimension, so the historical dimension. So what do I mean by the historical dimension? So um, as we're developing our software systems, often we accrue a lot of information in software repositories. So Garrett stores a lot of its information in a Git repository. And that information tends to pile up, like we just saw in the previous talk. Uh, you get gigabytes of information stored in these repositories. But it, it's rare that the, that information is turned into an actionable part of your development process. So um, you might leaf through it once in a while, um, to try and get answers to how a piece of code ended up the way it did. But it's largely like uh, books on the shelf in a library, just kind of sitting around collecting dust. Now, we have two ideas about how we can leverage this information to help with code review. So the first one is to try and generate context-aware feedback recommendations. So, um, like a code review may affect multiple files or multiple areas of code. Each one may be more or less prone to defects in the past. So you, 
you might be able to mine through a Git repository to figure out, you know, this area of code has been uh, buggy several times in the past six months. So when you're making changes here, reviewers should check carefully. Uh, the other thing we, we'd like to do with this historical data is use it to produce risk scores to help with prioritization of a review queue. So like I mentioned, the really active members of your teams, uh, they may have a, a large review queue that they need to prioritize. Now there may be uh, product considerations and schedule considerations that prioritize things, but one dimension we'd like to add to that prioritization is a, an awareness of how risky it uh, a change is. Now, those of you who are paying attention may recall that I've been talking about this problem at the Garrett uh, User Summit for quite some time. Um, and we, we call the problem the rubber stamping problem. So uh, an example to illustrate would be this uh, naive developer who's making a change to a source file, and they've introduced <coughs> they've introduced a go to uh, a go to fail error, where they're missing curly braces around the go to statement, and maybe they duplicated a line by mistake. Now this senior developer comes along and reviews the change and completely misses this obvious bug and just says ship it. So the question is, was this guy sleeping? Well, not really. So if we take a closer look at this developer, we realize he came in in the morning and has this massive queue of review tasks to get through. Uh, so he decides to be pragmatic and focus his effort on the risky patches. Now, the problem is not with this idea of focus, focusing on risky patches, but it's with the notion of how he figures out what risky patches look like. So maybe he's using some gut feeling or maybe he's doing something a little more clever by counting the size of patches. And based on his review queue, uh, this go-to fail bug, which was only three lines, ended up at the bottom of his uh, priority queue, and he ends up investing less effort in reviewing it. So how can we start to tackle this? Well, one of the ways, uh, that's one of the ideas that's been floating around academic circles for some years, is this idea of a just-in-time defect prediction model, which is kind of a mouthful, but in a nutshell, the way it works is we mine through your historical repository, your Git repository, and we try and assign some kind of blame to each historical patch to either label it as responsible for a future fix or not. And then what we can do is we can compute other features that we think associate with risk, right? Like let's say we calculate how much churn a patch introduces, or we calculate how many past bugs have been in the areas of code that have been changed. And we might compute a, a whole bunch of metrics uh, capturing things like developer expertise or diffusion across the code base. But at the end of the day, you end up with this really big table that you can feed into a modern machine learning or statistical regression approach. Now, rather than going into details, you can imagine it's like building a crystal ball, okay? Now, what can we do with this crystal ball? Well, as future patches flow in, we can compute that same set of metrics, but we won't know whether they're buggy or not. We can turn to our crystal ball and ask it, based on these metrics, how likely is it that each one of these patches is introducing a future bug, okay? And then based on this information, you can prioritize things like focusing on this patch during the review process. Now, this is one way that we we're thinking about leveraging historical data to help with this code review prioritization problem, okay? So the historical aspect, we're thinking about using that past data that just tends to accrue to incorporate that into your code review process. So you might imagine that we run a just-in-time defect prediction model to compute a risk score and provide that right away at the start of your review. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the next dimension, which is the deliverable dimension. 
So what do I mean by the deliverable dimension? Well, if we think about a software system like we think about an array of car parts, and what we want to deliver to our customers is this shiny red car, well, there's a, an important component in your software system that describes how to get from that array of car parts to the shiny red car at the end, and we commonly refer to it as a build system. Okay, so the build system describes that process uh, of going from sources to deliverables. Now, to give a very simple example, uh, they're often based on uh, a representation of dependencies. So we call it the acyclical dependency graph in technical terms, but it's nothing more than like describing the flow. So your C source code gets compiled into objects, which gets linked into executables, and then maybe bundled with documentation to produce an install uh, package, an installable package. Uh, this may also describe the set of tests that need to be executed, it may describe post-deployment steps, uh, and it can become really complex. So this example, while it's nice to look at and easy to, to understand, what does a real build system look like? Well, it looks a lot more like this. Like uh, this is the dependency graph from not even a very big software system. And what I'm showing is like these little circular nodes. Uh, the green nodes are the source files. Yellow nodes are branching operations. So there's some decisions that are being made by the build system about which sources to include, which ones not to include, uh, when to provide certain sets of compile flags, et cetera. And then the red nodes are, are deliverables. So in reality, while the previous example is nice to look at, it's unrealistic. Real software systems produce a very rich and complex dependency graph. And what I think is missing in, com in current reviewing interfaces is this perspective that we can gain by mining the dependency graph. So I did give a talk about some initial work we did uh, on this a few years ago at the Garrett Summit. Uh, the idea was that we would mine the dependency graph by executing the build. So there's a tool called Macau that um, takes as input a log that's produced during build and kind of puts together a dependency graph. Okay, and now if we know that you've changed uh, this example 1.c and this header file, we can then traverse up the dependency graph to figure out which deliverables are impacted. So these object files need to be recompiled, those deliverables, and that all target. And then we applied some post-processing to remove intermediate files or phony targets so that we would end up with a set of modified deliverables. Now, um, what we've been doing more recently is statically analyzing build systems using a tool that we're affectionately calling DPD. So, DPD isn't just a cute name, it's a pun based on the formula used for the surface area of a sphere, which is the diameter squared uh, times pi, okay? Um, but in a nutshell, you don't need to understand all these steps, but what we do is broken down into two phases. There's an indexing phase where we analyze your build description files. So in this case, we're focusing currently on CMake, um, and we produce like this index that later we can search based on patches. So from a patch, we can extract the modified files and then we can apply this exposure analyzer step where we uh, hit the index and we see which impacted deliverables, which deliverables are impacted under which configuration settings, okay? Now, if you have not paid attention to anything I've said yet. Now is the time to turn on because this is really important stuff for us. So what we are doing now is we've developed this DPD thing and we want to evaluate it to see if it actually helps. And we've designed a controlled study where we're going to ask participants, hopefully some of you will sign up to be participants, um, to perform some tasks. Now, one group is gonna be given access to our tool. 
Another group is going to be given access to a call graph based tool. And another group is going to be given no tools. And we're going to ask you to assess the potential impact of a set of patches or a set of scenarios. Now, as researchers, we'll define some ground truth and we'll compare the solutions provided by each group to see which approach is most effective and which is most efficient. Now, to give you a better idea of what those tasks might look like, um, one task is going to be like given a file and a particular set of configuration settings. We'd like you to determine which deliverables are impacted, so which executables, which shared libraries are affected by that file. Um, the second task is going to be, we'll give you a set of patches and we'd like you to rank them in terms of impacted deliverables or impacted variants. So uh, by variants, I mean like different versions of the system that run on different operating systems or uh, with different configuration settings like the free versus paid version of the product. And finally, the task will ask, um, given a set of patches, which ones affect a given set of deliverables or which ones affect a given set of variants. So like I said, we really do need your help. Um, the participant sign up form is on the screen right now. Um, and what I would love is if you guys could enter this, but it's quite a mouthful. Um, what I've done is I've posted a tweet uh, on the Software Rebels Twitter handle, which is shown at the bottom left of the slide, uh, where you can get quick access to this link. Uh, maybe we can also send it out as a chat message after the talk is over um, to try and make accessing this easy. Um, but essentially, we just need some of your time uh, to, to perform these tasks and we would be happy to provide uh, uh, some monetary reimbursement um, in terms of like a donation to some open um, charity or nonprofit of your choice. So yeah, I won't dilly dally here, but we are really, really hoping that we'll get some of you uh, to help us uh, with this user study. Okay, so in terms of the deliverable perspective, we foresee like being able to mine dependency graphs to help with impact assessment, which again is going to be integrated into the code review platform so that when you upload a patch, you immediately get to know which deliverables are impacted and under which configuration settings. Now, a couple of other dimensions that we're working on, I won't spend much time on. Um, are the operational and concurrent development perspectives. So what is the operational perspective? Well, as much as I love build dependency graphs, um, I've spent a large portion of my career studying build systems. Um, they are imperfect representations of a software system. Like it, it, it'll give you a perspective of, you know, which sources end up in which deliverables, but it's misinformation about how the system's being used. So an example would be like, what if I told you that only these, the small set of highlighted executables are used by most execution workflows. So it may be that your most popular workflows through the code only affect a small subset of the system. And that perspective would be really useful to incorporate in the code review interface. So I have a student now who's working on this. He just started in September, but what we're doing is we're trying to leverage execution logs. So since like instrumenting a system live is really difficult, we're trying to leverage like execution logs from the system to figure out what are the most popular and heavily run workflows through your code. And then we'll incorporate that again in a plugin that would help uh, during code review to say, you know, maybe you're changing code that's on the critical path for a lot of users, or you're changing code that's, you know, way out in the periphery, right? 
And the last aspect we're working on is concurrent development. So what do I mean by that? Well, we published a paper a couple of years ago about this idea of a review linkage graph, which I think is starting to find its way into um, Garrett. Um, you do have this like related changes area that's keeping track of things. But the idea of the linkage graph is a little broader because there are some kinds of links that I don't believe are supported. I'd be happy to chat with those involved to, to know if, it, if in fact I'm correct. But what we found is that there are several types of links. So one is this idea of patch dependencies, which I think is well supported. Um, another kind of uh, link is one that's created during the review. So um, sometimes reviewers will refer to a comment from another review or code from another review to help with a current review. Or they may use another review to provide additional evidence for a de design decision they're making in a current review. Um, there, are, there are problems in very large open source systems that welcome contributions from abroad. Um, where like a bug may solicit several fixes from multiple um, teams at the same time and now you've got a race um, between duplicate solutions for the same problem and we've seen that links are sometimes recorded to to capture that information um, and finally there's this feedback related kind of uh, chain of related code uh, reviews. So one review may inspire a future change or another review may fix issues that were discovered in a previous change. And uh, the code review analytics that we currently develop are kind of uh, missing this context. A lot of the ideas in the research world are based on this assumption that every review is interdependent, is uh, independent, sorry. But in fact, there are lots of messy uh, interactions that we need to keep track of. And I do have a student who's hopefully developing solutions that can help track and incorporate these kinds of links in the reviewing interface as well. So just to wrap up, um, I tried to give you this uh, perspective on the research that we're working on for the next few years. And the, the crux of it is that text-based differences, while they're pragmatic, are missing the broader context of concerns that authors and reviewers might have during a code review. And I talked about this metaphor of missing the forest for the trees, and we used four dimensions to try and illustrate different ways we can enhance that reviewing interface. So uh, yeah, like I said, my name's Shane. Uh, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll see that I tweeted out a link to this participant sign up. We're really hoping that we can get some, some participants from the Garrett community. Thanks for your attention. So at this stage, I'd be happy to take some questions. Uh, uh, okay. I can oh. I can uh, repeat the question you can answer. So the first question is is for me actually say how do you see an interaction between the scoring or reviews and the Garrett attention set? Yeah, the attention set is a new feature in Garrett from version 3.3 that is okay. actually giving priorities to reviewer to what's more important to review. Uh, and right, at the right. moment the the score is just given by for how long these people have been waiting but you basically give a much clever scoring. So how do you see the interaction between the time that reviews have been waiting, that is currently the attention set, and your scoring? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there may be some interesting interactions there, right? Like, um, like we are trying to help prioritize a review queue based on some concrete things we can measure from different perspectives by mining the build system by mining historical data um, but you might imagine that we could combine these scores with the attention score that you mentioned like uh, to give an awareness of how uh, stale a review request is 
um, to, to come up with an even uh, more comprehensive way of prioritizing things. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, it does. Thank you. So the okay. second question is, how do you see DPD sending feedback to Garrett? Yeah, yeah. So um, one way is, um, so currently the, the tool evaluation that we've designed is based on patches. So Garrett's not, not involved yet because we're just trying to isolate does DPD actually help people to assess patches. Now, um, one way would be through this uh, new, uh, but currently we just have bots that post comments, but it would be really nice to think about the user experience a little more. Um, but yeah, currently all that we're doing is having a bot that posts comments. So it'll download the latest version of the patch, extract the files from it, issue those as queries to the DPD index, and then report back about like a summary of the, the query results. Um, but if there are user experience people on the call who have ideas, uh, I'd be happy to chat. Yeah, I believe there is definitely in the most recent versions of Gary, the ability to have a dedicated tab on the chain screen. So you could have that okay. information pulled uh, directly without uh, polluting the comments. Yeah, and that will be a good, let's say, exercise. <laughs> Absolutely. So another question okay. from Ponch is saying, uh, do you use data coming from the repository you're analyzing to build your model or external data as well? For example, other repositories, history, or data coming from best practices, Stack Overflow, and so on? Mm -hmm. So um, there are studies about how to do, for example, just-in-time defect prediction, that idea of assessing the risk of a patch, um, to tackle like what's called the cold start problem. So if you're a new project, you don't have history to go mining, can you still do defect prediction there? Um, but there are challenges associated with going across contexts that are difficult to solve from a purely data science perspective. Um, so like the, your best bet would be to find some project that's very close to your context. So uh, an example would be if we train a defect prediction model using Chromium data, it might perform well for Firefox but it wouldn't perform so well for open office, let's say. Uh, so context really matters. And the closer you can get to your context, the better the performance. But, you know, that, that observation is, is not uh, set in stone. Like uh, there are new machine learning approaches and new data science approaches coming out all the time that might challenge that. 